Well, it's nice to be back. Yeah. Now, I hate to tell you, but we're actually we're going to be here three Sundays, and we're going to be gone three Sundays after that. So we'll just try to get through everything, right? Yeah, we have another. Let's start at three. Hmm. We could double up, yeah. I know I can do that. I just don't know if you guys can take it. <laughs> so we're on verse 7. And we are... Um, really, really some fun stuff in this thing. And if you remember, we're in the demon angels that have been released from the abyss. Verses 5 and 6. And they, where God gives them a, a command where they are not allowed to kill the people. And he tells them you can only torture them. <laughs> Don't you love that? You know, so much for God being sweet, right? Right. Um, you would think that when people, well, I suppose what happens is a lot of times people, most Christians, and Joe and I had a long conversation about it, most Christians actually don't know God. That's one of the problems, is that they think God is something that he's not. And um, because of that, many times we take advantage of the grace of God, which we're supposed to in a positive way, but not in a negative way. But what happens is that because you don't know God, you actually don't know how to act. You don't know. And God does require things from you. And your ignorance of Bible doctrine is usually what gets you further into trouble. It's usually what the part that causes you pain in life. Okay? So um, what happens to most Christianity <clears throat> is Christianity has been given to most Christians as morality. But Christianity is not morality. And most people don't know enough about the Word of God. In reality, morality has the ability to be both, uh, to be both uh, a good thing and a bad thing. Most of us think of morality as being um, a good thing. But in reality, morality has the ability to be degenerate. Most of the morality that we now see in our country by Christians is degeneracy. Meaning that it's moral, but it's not holy in any way. It follows the way of the, of the Pharisees. If you look at the Pharisees, they were perfectly moral, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfectly moral. But they were degenerate. <clears throat> what I mean is that they, they were so degenerate that in reality, Jesus called them the sons of Satan and that they were unbelievers. Mm -hmm. The reason I mention that is because it's important for us to know which one is which. Okay? And Christians don't know which one's it. You know, um, uh, Jeannie and I were talking about a book. And I, and I told you about the book before, so I want to write it down. Um, it's called He That Is Spiritual. And it's by uh, Lewis, uh, Sperry, Lewis Sperry Chafer. I tell you about his name. It's a little small book. But one of the nice things about it, um, it's probably... In my opinion, it's probably in the top five of the best books I've ever read. In that, this one is the one that actually where Louis Perry Schaefer died in 1952. He is the uh, he is the teacher and mentor of virtually every major uh, the theologian and major pastor of our time in probably the last 30, 40 years. He is a, he is the if you, if you hear me talk about systematic theology, those eight volumes, he's the writer of them. And, um, but he wrote this book, and one of the reasons he wrote this book is because Christians don't understand Christianity. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to straighten them out. Mm -hmm. He wanted to say, okay, you guys don't know what Christianity is because the church does not teach Christianity today. It teaches morality. Mm -hmm. And it uses the Gospels as that basis. And all of us, you know, we love Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in reality, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. Zero. Has no Christianity. And how do we know that? Christianity didn't even come about when the end of all four of those books were done. It hadn't, become, it hadn't come around yet. So the emphasis is significantly on the law, which is a law of morality. Okay? So that's why he wrote this book. This is a book that is, should be an ABC reading for every Christian. Because this, in this book, he tells you what Christianity is. Mm -hmm. You want to know how to walk with Jesus Christ? You want to have Christ <coughs> manifest? Read that book. It's the basics. It's written beautifully, too. And it's not hard. Oh, good. Now, the second recommendation I have is, of course, the 4,000 pages of systematic theology. Oh. Or, or you can read this page. It's only about 80 pages. Oh. Yeah. So let's start with verse 7. Now, we're going to cover the physical description 
of the uh, of, uh, of the demons, and these demons, um, as you remember from before, the difference between these demons, one of the most important things, is that these demons are visible. Right? Are they visible today? No. No. Where are they? Abyss. Yeah. They're imprisoned in the abyss, and they are released. Remember, through the abyss for the for the. Uh, corridor of the abyss that God gives them the key to. And they become visible in the tribulation. For only that, only that three and a half years, they become available. Okay? And that is the three and a half years, the last three and a half years of what is really understood as the great tribulation. Okay? So that's, so do we have to concern ourselves about this? No. You do if you're an unbeliever. You may go through it. But if you're a believer, we're not going to be there. Okay? We're just going to hear about all these saints that are killed by the demons. We're going to hear about the saints that or not the saints, the, the saints that are killed by the Antichrist. They're going to come into heaven as we've read in the last chapter. And we're going to see them. And we're going to get updated on what's happening. Otherwise, we won't know. Okay? So it's important to put yourself in perspective. Um, you know, one of the things I think is the funniest things I remember hearing when I understood what the tribulation was, was how much fear... Most Christians have the tribulation. They go, oh, the tribulation. It's like, has anybody told you you're not going to be there? <laughs> so, you can't be there. You're, and, that's, and that's the whole point of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, remember? Where it says, don't worry about it. You've, you've heard that, that the tribulation is happening. But the man of perdition, which is the Antichrist, cannot arrive until he, the Holy Spirit, is removed. And who goes with the Holy Spirit? We do. We do, that's right. That's, and that happens down in... right there. Okay. So, let's read the verse here, and we're going to be talking about stuff... I was trying to imagine some of these things, and I, I went online and, and took some of the... If you, if you have a chance to be entertained. Um, take some of the things that you read here and just type them in, okay? Uh, right, off, right off the verse. And then look at, look at images. And what you'll see is you'll see people who have written it down have drawn images of what they think these demons are going to look like. And out of the 40 or 50 I looked at, there was one that was relatively close. The other ones were just bizarre. Uh, they were really off base. But it says the, the locusts look like horses prepared for battle. Now if you remember the locust part, the locust is, is, is it actually a, a, we talked about it before, it is a use of a word that does not mean locust, but it's also, it's the word that is used in Joel and Isaiah and many other places as an invading army, okay? It is talked about with the invading army of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So when, when they are invaded, they talk about the locusts will come. Because what does the locusts do? They destroy everything. They, there's nothing at all. And, they, and they, have, uh, they have lots of things about them. So that's what they said. So it says, and the word here says they looked like, okay? And this is a, this is a word that is really important uh, to us. Um, so that, you don't, so that you don't act like the idiots who already do this stuff. The word like means that you're going to start an analogy. Okay? Okay? It means that, what analogy means, and like means, is that it looks like this, but it is not. Okay? So whenever you see a like, you can, you can count that this is very similar to a parable. Okay? And, and I mean, in its... Um, its direction is like a parable. A parable is a story that has a spiritual meaning, but has an earthly application by God using something, usually farming and things like that, so that we get to understand what he's talking about. But you can bet that the actual thing itself is never what he's trying to talk about. Okay? What he's, what he's trying to do, what a parable does, and what an analogy does, is it helps you understand something that is beyond your ability to understand. Okay? It's, um, we know the words, I've taught you guys the words anthropopathism and anthropomorphism. Okay? Morph meaning physical and path meaning thinking. Okay? And anthropomorphism and anthropopathism are a language, it's called a language of accommodation. It is designed by God to help you understand something that is beyond your ability to get it. So he gives you this thing. 
You know, it, you hear him say, uh, there, was, there was once a man who came into the land and he had a neighbor and the guy, you know, this is like the, uh, the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan never happened. Okay, it's a parable. Okay, how do you know it? It meets all the criteria of a parable. It has no name in it. And it's trying to emphasize a particular thing that God wants the Jews to understand. Okay? The bottom line of the whole thing is that God uses it to let the Jews know that the Samaritans that they hate are better people than they are. That's what he does for He pokes them in the eye. Okay? So, that's what when you have to see the word like. You have to understand that God's trying to help you with something, but it is not really what he is saying there. So it's not locusts. Uh, they're not stingers in, in the way that there are actually stingers. But some of the things that are in it in the next three verses are not things that are. They're ways to help you understand what, what the vision is and what they will act like. Okay? So he says, it look like horses. They're not horses, okay? They look like horses, okay? Uh, prepared for battle. Um, and and that, that's kind of like a battle dress. If you've ever seen horses in the, in the old thing, they have a battle dress. They have things that protect them from the, from the uh, army. Um, also, another thing, if you, know, if, you, if you don't know anything about cavalry, and this is just a, a principle, that for every one horseman that is in the cavalry, they will easily take over ten of people on the ground. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's why cavalry is it what it is. Um, is because that ratio is that you can, in, in reality, the ratio is 10 to 1. Okay, so it's a pretty good idea. <coughs> this has the same thing here, but even more so. It says, on their heads, they wore something like, see, like mm -hmm. is the word here, uh, like crowns of gold. And their faces resembled, but not like, human faces. So that should tell us a couple things. That one, whatever it is about angels, they resemble men in, in a great way, both, in both sides, right? We see that analogy on the elect side of God, the, the angels of God, we also see that exact same side here. So whatever it is there, they have that resemblance. And we're talking about only the physical ones. And the physical ones that are, have been restricted down the prison are let out only during this period. And for a very specific reason that we've talked about. So the Greek translation when it's direct would be, uh, now the appearance of the locust demons uh, was like, like the cavalry, uh, which had been prepared for warfare and on their heads crowns like gold, but not gold, but like gold, uh, and their faces like the faces of men. Um, so the piece here that we're trying to look at is that they had a, um, the, the, the purpose of them is kind of a shock and awe, okay? Um, the, the point about their, um, that's really what they're doing is there's hundreds of thousands of them, okay, of these demons. And they are very powerful. And they have this uh, in very intimidating part to them that, that we find here. Um, with, with they, um, if, the, the part about the golden crowns, it's, it's kind of like a, if you're familiar with it, it's kind of like a military insignia. Okay? So it has nothing to it other than that this is, this is probably the second greatest army uh, of demons that exist. Okay? And I say the second greatest because the first greatest, we'll find out later, and the third woe is actually the ones that um, Satan has that actually now occupy heaven, okay, in, in, in other places. So it's kind of like if you've ever seen the, the you ever seen the, uh, I, th I think about it, when I was in the service, uh, I, was, uh, I was a paratrooper stationed in Fort, in Fort Benning, and we always saw a lot of the, the Screaming Eagles, the, the 101st Infantry, you know, they were 101st Airborne Division, and they had an eagle, you know, you know a patch on their thing. And this is very similar, so it's kind of like an attribute to what they are. That's what that, that it kind of identifies uh, who they are. So it has that same as a military insignia. That's why it uses the word like, and whatever it is, that is the um, that is their insignia of their victory uh, of their being uh, victorious. The um, let me see the other part. This, um, they're in the abyss today. I think I already talked about that. You know um, what is here is that one of the things important is that. We tend to look at, and I want, to, I want to kind of back you up for a second, is that what we look at is that this army is looked at as being something we should be terrified of. Well, we don't have to be terrified of it. But it's important to understand that the, and I wrote these verses down for this reason, is that the important thing to understand with, with the demons is that the greatest influence on the world today are not demons like this. Okay? They're actually the quiet demons. Okay? 
the ones that have the ability, because many times we look at, uh, I'll just take it, we look at, there's, there is demon possession, okay, and there's demon influence. There's both of these that exist in the world today. Now, the demon possession can only be done to unbelievers, right? That was supposed to be, you're supposed to see, yeah, that's right, you know. And the reason we know that is because they, you cannot be possessed by a demon as a believer because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Okay, so that cannot happen. Um, lots of lots of theologians say differently, but the doctrine of, of the indwelling of Christ in you, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, tells you that a demon cannot possess you under any circumstances. Okay, as a believer, he can influence you. Okay, so this is, can be done for believers. Okay, and unbelievers. Can be done for either one. Um, and this is where the demon, how do they influence you, influence you? Is that when you reject, okay, we talked about this, when you reject Bible doctrine, okay, in your, in your soul, when you hear a piece of doctrine and you reject that, the only thing that can replace that Bible doctrine is what? Doctrine of demons. Hmm? Doctrine of demons. Doctrine of demons, that's right. The doctrine of demons. So when you say no to God, what's in there? The doctrine of demons. That's where it fits. Um, because in reality, we've talked about this a million times. Your brain looks like this. Actually, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And in each principle, you have a place in it that is either of God or it's of the world. So those are the two things you have. Okay. This right here is called Bible doctrine. Principles of God, right? This one here is of the world. This is called evil as a way of thinking. But it's also called the doctrine of demons in the Bible. The Bible calls it the doctrine of demons. D.D. Okay. or B.D.? Hmm? D.D. or B.D.? Yeah, exactly. You have two choices. So whenever you reject something of God, the only thing that is left over is to fill that. Because in your principles of understanding things, there's only two things you can have. Either you can have God or you can have the world. They're mutually exclusive, okay? An example, the best example and the easiest one, is that let's say this little box right here, and there's, like I said, there's thousands of these boxes. For everything that you believe in, every principle that you have has this little box on how do you deal with it, okay? A principle. Before you become saved, okay, you believe that Jesus Christ is a really good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's moral. Lots of people really like him. But when you say he is the Savior and God, what do they do with that? They reject it. Try it sometime. You can say, say you know, one of my greatest heroes in, in life is Jesus Christ. And people go, oh yeah, me too. I, he's a great man. Probably the greatest man that's ever lived. And then you sit there and say, yeah, you know something? He is the Savior of the world and he is God. Whew. Now you get a fight. <laughs> okay. You notice that? Sure. Just, like, sure. just like that. Okay. The reason being is that it's fine for Jesus to be a good guy, but it's not fine for him to be uh, the Son of God, not good than the Savior. So they reject that immediately. Okay. When they do accept the gospel, this little part about who they think Jesus is, you know the part where Jesus says, "Who do they say I am? Who do they say I am?" Okay. When that changes, and you become saved with gospel, I will not. That one little area is now the answer to that is that I believe I believe what, I believe what the Bible says. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is my Lord and He is my Savior. Okay, that little spot that was previously the world point of view changes. Okay, and like I said, all the other points of view when somebody first gets saved day one, they, they everything else, all these other boxes have W's in them. Right? They couldn't be they couldn't be otherwise. They have W's in them. But this one has changed. So when you come to Bible study and you read the Bible and you allow to, the Lord to change you, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and prove God's will. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. These become Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine, Bible doctrine. Okay? And a Christian's ability to walk with God and to fulfill the plan of God and to be like Christ is exactly the amount that he has those filled with Bible doctrine. Okay? And to the amount that he still has the world in him is the part that still thinks evil. 
problem is that many times that evil is what we would call good. It's moral. And you know where I'm going to go with this, right? Be nice. Be nice. Okay. Be nice. Be sweet. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was making a joke about it. Again. Okay. This is not Christianity. Yeah. Like sugar. <laughs> Why isn't this Christianity? Because unbelievers can do it. That's the acid test. So, this is nice and sweet. What God has in mind is what? Holy. Holy. You know, the holy viewpoint is that this is who Jesus is. The world's viewpoint, this is who Jesus is. So, whose viewpoint do you have? Yeah, that's always the question that's before you. Whose viewpoint do you possess? Okay? So, demon influence to Christianity who believe that Christianity is about being nice, sweet, and kind, is in reality not a godly viewpoint. It's the viewpoint of Satan. Okay? Most of us have trouble with that. When you first say, yeah, but we've got to be nice. No, no. Nice is not a goal. It is a result. Okay? That's the result. It's because Christ reigns in my heart, because I believe in Bible doctrine, because I walk in the Holy Spirit, because Christ comes through me, because He lives in me, because of that, I appear from all circumstances to be nice. Sometimes I'm not. Okay? Um, I think that much of the nice, sweet part of Jesus will be revealed at this time. Right? That's when we'll have an idea what nice means, right? Mm -hmm. Satan's whole retort to this is that how can a loving God condemn his creation to hell? He's just. He's just, that's right. He can't, he can't sacrifice justice for love. He cannot. If he can do that, then he is not just, he is not righteous, and he is not God. Okay? So, um, this is a really important piece. So I, I, I put some pieces up here to help understand this. Okay? Um, this has to do with these pieces that we're talking about. Possession and influence. The reason I make this point is that the most thing that you should be prepared and careful of is to make sure that you do not have demon influence in your thinking. Okay? Now, that's one of the problems of demon influence is that when I say demon, people think sin, awful, adultery, murder, all these bad things. In reality, demon influence is when you think good and nice and sweet and kind. Why is that demon influence? Because it's not holy. In reality, it's not holy in that the world is good, nice, sweet, and kind. So it tells you it's not God, right? If the world can do it, it cannot be of God. That's a hard thing to swallow. But most Christianity uses that as its standard. So the important part here is to understand that you cannot be possessed but the great because because the fact that you are a believer. But in reality, you can be influenced. And many Christians, most Christians today, have the doctrines of demons in their mentality. They're not evil. They're not mean. They're not adulterers. They're not bad husbands. They're not bad fathers. What they do do is they think like the world. Okay? And by definition, that is demonic influence. That's worldly thinking. So you always have to compare. You have, if you don't know the difference between these two, you will be acting just like the world as a moral, sweet, nice person. And that's, that's the definition. That's why, that's why people make the mistake of accepting the Ten Commandments. Right? I always get in trouble with this one. Yeah, you do. Ten Commandments are not a Christian standard. They're a moral standard. Yeah. They're, a, they're a standard of Israel. Note that the Pharisees kept the Ten Commandments. Okay? They, they, they kept them to the maximum. Paul says it, doesn't he? He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I kept them all. Okay? But yet, had he not met Christ on, on the road to Damascus, he would have gone to hell. And been, in reality, his own definition of himself was the chief of sinners. The worst of the worst. Okay? Well, and he was moral that entire time. So these are not ours. This is ours. Okay? And the only way you can be this is by walking in the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Holy Spirit. That's it.
Bible doctrine. Virtue. That's, what, that's the result. God in me, Christ in me. I can do all things. You know, this is kind of revealing that the road is narrow. It's, it's very narrow, you know. Um, in fact, usually when you, my joke is that usually when you find yourself on a big highway, you're in the wrong place. But most people don't think that. In reality, Christianity is on this huge highway. The majority of this. How, how can you tell? Because today, Christianity is virtually emasculated. Virtually, Christianity, we have all these churches. What kind of impact do we have on this country? Did you read the paper this morning? <laughs> this is how much impact we've had lately. Look at the news. Okay. What does that tell you? We're not doing our job. Okay. It is the light of the world that we are. We are Christ's light to the world. And when we act that way, evil has to move. It has to. So it tells you that Christianity is not doing it. And the one reason is because they believe this rubbish. On, in reality, they are demon influence. They have incorrect values. They do not have Bible doctrine because they do not identify it, like I was saying in this book. And because of that, they think sweet and nice is, is the standard. Or the Ten Commandments. I'm really good. I don't, I don't do anything wrong. I don't cuss. I don't smoke. I don't chew gum. Yeah. Just messing with you on that one. But you get the point. Okay. So that's important to understand that. that this, now here's some of the values for these things. I'm just leaving these for you. It helps us understand is how do, how do they do these things. In reality, this is a great verse, Romans 1, 18 through 25. This tells us that <clears throat> there's a couple things in it. But one of the things that it talks about how a deprived mind happens is that when you reject Bible doctrine, any principle of God, you will automatically have as part of that a part of your mind that is in depravity. Okay. Now, others won't write. Others may not uh, notice it because, from the world point of view, you're good and you're nice, and you and you and you give your tithes and offerings, okay? and you show up on Sunday morning, and you might even be a deacon like me. Yeah? Oh, my goodness, he must be holy. He must, he must be godly. He does. He, he, ah. In reality, it means it's all rubbish in reality. The only thing that matters is the fact that you do these things because this is the definition of the Christian life. Okay? So that's what this piece says right here. Is that in reality, they have deprived minds. You know what a deprived mind? A deprived mind is one that is deprived and doesn't know it's deprived. Mm -hmm. Isn't that? God has, God has a, uh, if you've ever read this verse, it says there, it says, when you have people who reject God and reject his principles. God replaces that rejection, what we're talking about, with Bible doctrine, with stupidity. Okay? So if you're not going to take the holiness of God, I'll give you the world vision um, in that box. You'll get, since you rejected this one, I'll give you this one. And if you read this pieces right, you will be so stupid, but you will think you're a genius. Okay? You, you, you look at the stuff on Facebook sometimes, some of the political stuff we have, and you look at it and you go, do you really believe that stupid stuff? And they do. So don't think that they're trying to, they're not trying to peddle something, they're not playing a game with you. They actually believe that rubbish. How do you know that? It's because that's what it says in the Bible. It says, when you reject God, God gives you, as a part of that rejection, a foolish mind. A foolish mind. One that rejects. You get, because you rejected the Bible, he gives you a God-rejecting mind as a consequence of that. So you become a fool. But you're, but you're a happy fool, and you're a self-righteous fool, and you think that you're really smart, and everybody else doesn't know anything. Okay? But that's where that comes from. So they're not uh, messing with you. They actually believe that you're a fool, and they're a genius. So just in case that. Um, uh, also tells us that as part of this demon influence, that Satan has the ability to blind those who are perishing. Okay. Um, when you ref and it says here, when you refuse the truth, the consequence of that is a mind that does that does not know him. When you refuse the truth, and that truth is Bible doctrine. God replaces it. And the parrot says perishing people. Unbelievers do the same thing. The difference is that an unbeliever rejects the gospel. Okay? That's what he rejects. That's all he can reject, right? Um, what a believer rejects is Bible doctrine, the principles of God that are in the Scripture. Okay, and they're, and they're shown right here, First Corinthians one eighteen. This is what the believer does. Here's the unbeliever who rejects Bible doctrine. 
And that Bible doctor for him is the gospel. Okay. So you understand that the people that we are up against in this demon part are enormous. I actually have about 10 verses here if you want to look at them. This is also 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. And 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. Those are where, that shows you where unbelievers are blinded by Satan to the truth of God. Believers are, this verse up here, plus 2 Corinthians 6, verse 11 and 12. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. And this verse up here. This is, these are the people, in, in Romans 16, 17, and 18 is the ones who are called the enemy of the cross. Many people think that those are unbelievers. The context tells us that they are believers. They have actually gone from the side that they would be on God's side, but what happens is they are demon influenced. So they are actually advocates and living, living for Satan all the time thinking that they are holy. I'll give you, I'll give you some categories on that, but I'll probably get in trouble. Um... <clears throat> go to the next piece. Let me get more description here. Um, their hair, let's talk about the demons. Their hair was like, okay, look at that, word like this, another analogy. Uh, woman, a woman's hair, okay, and their teeth like, same word, right, a lion's teeth, like lion's teeth, okay. Um, the Greek part of that says, furthermore, they had hair like the, like the hair of a woman, that's the exact translation, and teeth uh, were like that of the teeth of a lion. Um, the piece that's really important here is that you can get stuck by that, but the, most people don't know this because they, there's one of the things about Bible doctrine they don't get, is long hair for a woman is her beauty, right? It is, is actually a sign of submission to her husband, okay? Or submission to Christ if she's not, if she's, uh, uh, if she's uh, not married. Um, but on a man, it's actually a sign of rebellion. And let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11.14 for just a second. Because I want to show that to you. It's, it's a verse I bring up all the time. This is, this is how the Word of God does it. 1 Corinthians 11.14. It, it, it gives you context for this thing here. For this verse. Um, and see, if you know, angels are all male. Okay, why? Because they didn't recreate and they didn't, there was no purpose in that. A man and woman had to procreate, so God made one and kind of made them, he actually made two perfect, complete souls, but he gave them different duties. Okay, uh, and I think we've talked about that enough time is that a man and a woman have a duty here, but when you die, you will no longer have that duty. You will no longer be submissive. Okay? You will actually be your own person, 100%. In reality, from God's point of view, your soul and your representation before Christ is 100% 100 equal with your husband's. That makes sense? Your role is different. Okay, that's the only thing that's different. Your role is different. Your role is to be submissive. And that's part of your curse in reality because the bone head thing that Eve did. Okay, we all know that part. But that's a pe that piece. But the, the piece of the submissive here is the part in this verse where it says... Um, he says, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? Okay? Now, a lot of people said, well, that was back then. But note the wording of it. It says, does not nature itself. Nature. How long is nature? From the beginning to the end. Okay? It means that this is not contextual. It means that it's not for one. How do you know? And the Holy Spirit puts these things in there for us to orient ourselves. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, that was in the Old Testament. You know, that, was a, that was back in those days. No, no. That's as true today as it is then. What it means is that the authority of God has given, if you know the rest of this verse, that a man has short hair and a woman has long hair. And that's not, so the first thing, what's long, what's short? It's a relative thing. So Jeannie has no competition with me with respect to my hair, right? She's, she's safe. Um, they could get a lot shorter. And she would be in complete compliance with this because that's what it is. Okay? The, the, the piece here tells us that when you have a man who grows long hair, it is an act of rebellion. It is a, and, and, and most people don't think so, but it really is saying that God's principles, which we've talked about these, are, it's called divine establishment. It's the principles that God wrote into it. It says that long hair is perfect for a woman 
and, and short hair is perfect for a man. When you reverse those, you are breaking divine uh, establishment principles of God. In reality, it is an act of rebellion, okay, against the principles. Okay. So For this very reason, reversing this is the roles. The reversing the roles. And what happens is a lot of times you'll see them while they'll actually have a part of femininity to them. Okay? And the reason that is, is because they, they will they will hold a femininity into its wrong spot. Okay, uh, meaning relative to the word of God, they don't know where it fits. Okay. Um, a man has a very specific role. Okay? Our role is to lead, it is to protect. If we do not do those things, we have missed our role, okay? We are acting just like the person with the short hair, the, the woman with the short hair, and the man with the long hair. So that's, the, that's why it also shows here, in this piece here. Now there's another piece to this same parallel, and that's why it's important to understand that the word like, is that there's two things that are in it. One is, a, uh, is the act of rebellion that they have, because even as angels, they should not have long hair, okay? They should have short hair. All the angels that are shown properly all have short hair, okay? You look at, at once, you look at a lot of the pictures of Jesus with long hair, they're an absolute lie. Okay? Jesus did not have long hair, he had short hair. How do we know? Because he was the one who wrote this stuff. Okay? <laughs> he complied with it. So all those little pictures with Jesus with his beautiful long flowing hair are absolute demonic. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. What happened is that came out of the Renaissance when the world started getting a little feminine and men started growing long hair and that kind of got stuck in there. But in reality it is demonic. Uh, who else had long, had short hair? Moses. All the pictures of Moses have what? Mm. Long white hair. No, yeah. no long. It was short. If you look at even ancient history, the men who were great men in, our, in, in history generally always always had very short hair. Okay. Charlton Heston had short. Hmm? Charlton Heston had short hair. Yeah. Caesar, Caesar had long hair. Napoleon had long hair. Had short hair. These guys all had short hair. All of them did. You look at the pictures. Of what about Samson? Huh? Samson was different. He was a Nazarite. Okay? Oh, yeah. Nazarite was total submission. Okay? In every way. Remember, there's lots of things you could. I mean, oh, that kind of proves your point. Yeah. Yeah. Total, yeah. Total submission to God. He had. A Nazarite had no rights. Okay? He had, no, he had none. He, he did everything God told him to in the conversation. Okay? And when he, when he as a ruler, which he was, he was God's person. When he cut his hair, God had put that power in him, okay? Because of his hair, it was a contract, okay? So the Nazarite has that to be true. Uh, you could also look at other pieces that, you know, when he had honey and he had a little bit of wine. See, those aren't the evil things, right? Dead, being a dead, pop, uh, dead people, that's not wrong, right? So he's the only one Nazarite? No, no, no there's, lots of Nazarite, na there's lots of Nazarites in the scriptures. The Nazarite place was one of appointment by God and an acceptance by the person. Okay. It's called the Nazarite. It's part of the part of the law. But they were they were required to do certain things. Okay, and one of them was not cut their hair. Every, any hair, zero, not one. Okay, they could not. Okay, so it, that, and that is that exception for that reason. But also the other thing about hair, if you remember long hair, what is the other thing about it? It is beauty. Beautiful, okay. Now I hate to say it, but us men we're not supposed to be beautiful, and I know I'm the exception to that, right? <laughs> I'm thinking that, you know. um, yeah, right. Um, so, but what is what what is it? What does beauty do? It, it attracts. It does, and this is actually a direct reflection to Satan. Satan was beautiful. If you look at him in Ezekiel uh, twenty-eight twelve, write these down. Okay, so Ezekiel twenty-eight twelve. 28, 12. He is the most beautiful creature ever made by the hand of God. And I think I've told you before, if, if Satan walked, down, walked into that door right now, it would take every bit of Bible doctrine you have ever learned not to worship him. He probably okay. had long hair. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah he probably had long hair. That charisma. I don't even want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his charisma makes Clinton look like a fool. I mean, you know, if, you, if you know the influence that Bill Clinton has on people. You know. He does. He, he can, even today, he can walk into a group of women and they just fawn all over him. It's like, yeah, what? Is stupid? Don't you, don't you know history? Don't you? Anyway, I won't. This might end up on the internet and I'll be in trouble. Um, so, but what does beauty do? It draws you into it. Okay? I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but you know, when I first saw my wife, I thought, wow. I'm a sucker even today. Okay? I, I go down hard. Um, and, and, and the truth is that if it weren't for Bible doctrine, I would, I would almost worship my wife. 
That's how much I love her. That's how beautiful she is to me. And I'm going to be in real trouble today, so pray for me. Because she's going to be mad at me. But it's true. It's true. Uh, that beauty is one that attracts. And what, the interesting thing about a beauty is that beauty does what it's supposed to do. And women and men know this stuff, right? We know that when a woman is really beautiful to a man, he is in his, he is in his greatest weakness. Right? Remember Delilah? <laughs> okay? He's a fool's fool. Okay? If my wife could use me wrong, I'd be a fool's fool. Trust me, I'd really have to struggle with it to put Bible doctrine back where it's supposed to be. But that's what it has. It has the ability. It is a position for the responder of it. It is a position of complete weakness. Okay? It's not a position of strength. It's weakness that I have. She has the strength in this case. Okay? But that's what beauty does. Beauty has that. When you see something beautiful, you go, <sighs> okay? you drop all of your guards, and all you can see is this beautiful object. This is, the, this is exactly what is happening here. In reality, the demons have this quality for the beauty aspect of it, as does Satan, to make everybody drop their guard, okay? Because they're about to have their head ripped off by the, by the lion's side, okay? In this case, they're going to get stung. But I imagine what happens, you're going to think, well, why don't people see these things and run? They're not going to run, they're going to go, wow. They're going to be, like, dumbfounded until they get stuck, you know, until they get stung. <clears throat> But it, but it helps you understand that this is the dynamics that's taking place here. There's a beauty and there's a vulnerability, but there's also a total disobedience to God's will and God's way that's, that's shown by the long hair. And that's why I gave you that verse. Um, Satan has that same, that same piece. The other piece of this thing is that they become absolutely vulnerable. Uh, the attraction, the, the world's attraction, if you, if you take a parallel to this, the world's attraction to us is beautiful, Okay? Now, it isn't if you have Bible doctrine, but if you don't, it's like, okay, guys, I tell you what, today, I'm going to give you each a million dollars. Yeah. <sighs> I promise you don't believe it. Okay, so it doesn't help that. But in reality, what, is that, what does that have to us? The world looks beautiful to its inhabitants. Okay, Money, fame, power, being loved, being, being accepted. Those are huge, powerful. They are beauty to us. It is what the world speaks to us to make us usable, okay? So that's part of it. So we think about what, but what happens when you actually get it, okay? It doesn't deliver, does it? Okay, it doesn't deliver. In reality, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you get a million dollars, what happens, you go, you start using it in all the crazy ways, then you say, well, I wonder why I didn't get 10. I really could use 10 million. A million's okay, but, uh, you know, Lord, 10 million would really hit the spot better. It's, it, what does that tell us? It, it's unsatisfying. It, ha, it doesn't have that ability to do that. And that's true with everything. That's why the people, Gene and I were watching that program with that guy, Anthony, what his name is. But we, we were looking at the show, and this, this guy has everything. Is he happy? He's miserable. He's absolutely miserable. Okay, because it promises, but it doesn't deliver. Beauty does the same thing. Ultimately, when you are in love with somebody, that beauty has to be replaced with a beauty on the inside. Now, I'm really fortunate I actually knew about the first, the second part before I knew about the first part, okay? Is that, I don't get in more trouble with that early. So we'll just leave that one alone, you know what I mean? And we all, the other part has to be delivered, because what happens is the beauty, you start taking that for granted. No matter how beautiful a woman is, you, you see it all the time, right? A man has a beautiful wife, what's he do? Cheats on her with an ugly woman. It's like, and you look and you go, what are you, stupid? You know, but it happens all the time. Okay. Why? It's because there has to be something else. The beauty is just deceiving. What the world offers is deceiving. It will never, ever deliver on what it offers. Ever. Because that's not how God... Does God deliver on what he offers? A thousand times more. Okay? So that's, that's the whole principle. That's what's happening here. The other part is that, in reality, it puts us in a position of weakness to make us vulnerable. And that's the whole purpose of this army. It's to do a couple things. It's to make us weak, and to make and, and to be powerful at the same time to overcome us. Okay, so that's the piece that's in here, um, and that's why it's, it, that's why it's important to keep yourself. Bible doctrine centers you. Why? Because it is true. Okay, it's true. It is an orienting point. Why do we have the ability to live different lives? It because by the Word of God we refresh our minds. In Bible study, we accept the Lord, we read His Word, we submit ourselves, and thereby are rightly oriented to the absolute truth of the universe, of time and eternity. That's what makes the difference. When you reject that, like I said, when unbelievers reject that Bible doctrine, 
they accept the truth. They, they accept something that is not true, mm -hmm. and thereby they have the consequence of it, just like the beauty and the, and the lion's teeth. Okay. Um, and I'm going to a little bit. I said sometimes beauty um, is followed by absolute ruthlessness. The offer makes a great offer, but delivers nothing. Pain, destruction, and grief. Okay. Um, so we are talking about demon influence. Okay, so let's go to the next verse. We'll read it, stop there, and we'll come, we'll come to it next week. Um, this is more the, the physical part. And like I said, you'll see this word like. Help, it to, help you to understand that what it is telling you is something of its quality in a visual way that helps you understand, just like the parable does the same thing. It says they had breastplates, like, analogy, breastplates of iron. Uh, the sounds of their wings was like thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Yes, so we'll come back. It's not mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it oh, is. Oh, good. Okay, sorry guys. We're still going to be stuck. You, you have to suck this up. What am I doing with my clock? Huh. Oh, well. We actually have like. Eight minutes, so... Okay, so let's go to this verse. This verse is the same thing. So the, 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 the Greek part of this says, um, also they had breastplates like... They had breastplates like the breastplates of iron. Now, see, when he's writing this, this is, a, this is the Roman time. Okay, so what the Roman part of the breastplate was, that you couldn't, you couldn't penetrate it. And if you look at it, it's breastplates of what? Iron. <clears throat> iron, if you look at the... You have to know a little bit about ancient history about bronze, copper, and things like that, that could not penetrate steel. So the person who invented, when they came up with the, the, the iron sword, the people in the Bronze Age could not overcome them. Why? Because when I take a bronze sword and I hit it with an iron sword, the bronze one breaks and I kill them. Okay? So what this is telling us, this is telling us something from the time frame when this is written, that one of the, one of the reasons that the the Romans were able to overcome the barbarians just because the barbarians had no armor. Okay? In fact, I'm going to tell you this is kind of gross, but the real battles when the, when the, uh, against the barbarians, um, just a little joke, you know, why, you know why they're called barbarians? Because when the Romans heard them compared to the Greek then they would go, bah, 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 that's all they hear. So they called them barbarians, that's where they came from. But what they would do when they went to battle, they would, and they had long hair, barbarians did, because uh, they had, did not have these standards. They had a big, long sword, okay? We, we've learned about that one. That's the uh, Rumphira, remember? We talked about it before. Big, long sword, single edge, right? They had no armor. Matter of fact, they had no clothes. They used, to, they used to scream and come charging completely naked, okay? And one of the reasons they did that was to, is that, I don't know about you, but if I see a big, naked, long-haired guy running at me, I'm not going to pick my sword up. I'm going to go... And that's what the, that's what the whole purpose was. Okay, was to kind of defeat them by that by that particular um, notion, that, that, that philosophy. But what happened is that the, as we know from history, the Romans conquered the Romans. If you know, they were actually little people. They weren't big people. They were little. Okay, uh, they were very short. I think their tall people were like five foot five, <laughs> but they were, most of them were about five foot. They were very small. But what they did have is they had these iron breastplates, and they had the, this. Uh, uh, um, the sword, the double-edged sword, the Machaira, if you remember that one. And so what happened is that it was a short-edged sword, they had a longer one, and they had a shorter one. So what they would do with the barbarians is they would go, choo, choo, like that. And if they got hit, it would hit them, but it wouldn't penetrate it, because their swords were made of different material, because the Romans... So this is telling us here with that, in reality, is that what it's telling us is that the armored breastplate that they have has its roots in the military of the, of the Romans, which is when he's writing this, that essentially these demons could not be harmed. They couldn't, you couldn't, they couldn't, they were, um, you couldn't defeat them. As a person, you could not defeat them. It was impossible, okay? They had nothing that was vulnerable on their side, okay? The other part is the part, the part of their wings fluttering. They actually didn't have wings. Again, this, this, is, a, uh, this is an analogy, so if, if, you're, if you're seeing this thing, um, anything other than an analogy, it helps you understand it. Um, a lot of people have made analogies to these things, to like helicopters, 
and things like that, um, modern warfare, because they do have a lot in common with them, okay? But this is telling us that these are demons. These are not mechanized vehicles, these mechanized military things. They are actually demons. They're real. This is what they look like by analogy when, when they're given uh, through the vision. Um, and the thundering part is a very similar to Marash Tanya, is a battle cry. Uh, a battle cry does two things. If you've had anything to do with the military, you know this. It has two things. One, it is an expression that actually, it, it actually makes the person who does it more powerful because their emotion just boosts up like an adrenaline. So it has that effect on the side that, the side that is uh, attacking. The, the side it has on the other person is that it is terrifying. You know, it, like I said, dude, think, think about the, think about a thousand naked men, big guys in the big stores, screaming, <laughs> screaming and yelling. It's very disarming. That is the purpose of a battle cry. Battle cry is not a communication. It is a cry on purpose to to incite terror into the person who's going to harm. Okay, and that's what this is. It's happening. working. It's working. It's working. I'm yeah, out of yeah. Here. I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, you know uh, what happens is that in, in our stable minds we think that we're stable, but when you put us in a in a different setting, in reality, <laughs> the mind has the has the ability to to go into fear, just like that. What is the purpose of the battle cry and terror? Is it stops the person from thinking? Okay. Oh. The same thing happens to us. When something happens to us, uh, like what happens is that when, when you become afraid, when somebody's attacking you or, or something happens to you, somebody dies, what's the first thing that happens? It shuts down your thinking. Okay. You, you go, you're, 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 you're stupid. You know? you know the answer to this question. You've known it for years. But when you get scared, your brain goes zero. And you go, what do I do? Okay. When a tragedy happens, the same thing is. One of the things you do as a Christian is that you memorize doctrine so that you can kind of restart the engine. You know, your brain start working again. Mm -hmm. The most important thing to do when you are in a situation of, of fear is to restart your engine. It's part of restart your, quite going through your doctrine. It's a part that says, okay, wait a minute, why is this happening? Did God drop me? No, God's omnipotent. God's not powerful. What am I doing here? I better figure out what that is because God has something for me to do. And that's what happens. You start rebooting it because that's what this does. That's exactly what is happening here is that they're being paralyzed. And this happens to us. Whenever we are in fear, whenever something happens to us and startles us, the first thing that happens is that your brain shuts down. And all that doctrine you learn is for zero at that moment. And you have to sit there and start walking yourself through doctrine. That's why it's important to know it. If you're, if you're a Christian who does not have doctrine, guess what? You have nothing to start over with. You have nothing to reboot it with. This is, called, this is called the doctrine of the essence of God. This is why I teach it to you. If you know only these things right here, you have the ability to recover and to reorient yourself completely to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Just by knowing, just by remembering what, what God is. God's, so, God's sovereign. God has absolute power. Am I a victim? No, I can't be. Why? I'm his. He's powerful. God has a standard. It's a righteous standard. God is absolutely just. Well, he let things unfair happen to me for any bad reason other than the good of me. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things. No, he won't. God loves me. How much does he love me? He loves me more than anybody ever has loved me in my entire life by a million times. Okay? I have eternal life. I have nothing to lose here. Take this body and I will live forever. Okay? Omniscient. God knew what was going to happen to me a hundred bazillion years ago. He knew it. He knows what you're thinking this very minute. He knew it forever ago. There was never a time that God did not know exactly what you're thinking. Ever. What was going to happen to you. Okay. Can God take care of this? I don't know about you, but I went out and looked at the stars last night, and the universe happens to be very, very big. <laughs> yeah. Milky Way was streaking across. I was just going to what a display, right? What a display. Immutability, God does not change. He has to love me. He has no choice because he saved me. Even if I'm a bum. Even if I don't do what he wants me to. This is the part of the scripture where it says that I have the ability to give up God, but God, the Lord, just cannot give up me. He has to be true to himself. So, immutability, and the veracity. What God tells me is always true, truer than anything else. So those are the things that, that, that help you in this kind of thing. The, the analogy here is to help us understand that, that, these, that these beings are going to destroy these people. Okay, not destroy it in a, in a death sentence. He's going to destroy it, as we've talked about, to put them in so much pain, to put them in so much torture for five months. 
Okay? And what's that, what's that called? Most people sit down and say, that's horrible. The world point of view is, how can God do that? And the answer to that is that if he does not do that, they will not have enough consciousness at that moment to realize that they have the ability to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. So this is called grace before judgment. Because the judgment that they should be concerned about is that judgment. Right? That's the one they should be concerned about. And that's, that is proper orientation. Um, now we're out of time by one minute. So we'll come back to this thing, but think about it. Um, think, think about it. We're going to read one more, yeah, one more description, and then we're going to go into verse 11. Verse 11 is really, really cool. Um, but, but think about, the, the, the reason this is important is because what it does do it is it orients us to the truth. Many times as human beings, I've talked about it before, sin nature in the worldly viewpoint makes complete sense to us. Why? Because we have it around us everywhere. It is our first native language. Okay? It is always important for us to reorient ourselves to the truth of God so that we do what He asks us to and that we always take care of ourselves. Okay? So let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the truth that you write in all these things, that even in this horrible time that we're reviewing in the tribulation that we won't even be there for. Your truth is always true. It's always right there. Even though these beings are great and powerful, in reality, we are, we are kept from them by your power. We are protected, when we, especially when we, when we get under the shelter of your word and your spirit and your truth. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that we will pick your way and your viewpoint above all, no matter what we see and know. I ask this in Jesus' name, who did that perfectly. Amen. Mm -hmm.